basics about how uh, fatty acids were oxidized. It's a process that I referred to as beta oxidation. And um, that process of beta oxidation, as you saw, has reactions that are very similar to reactions that we saw in the citric acid cycle. So those weren't uh, any surprise. I want to talk about a couple other things with respect to breakdown of fatty acids. What you saw on Wednesday was the breakdown of saturated fatty acids. Okay? When there are double bonds in the fatty acids, it's a little different. Okay? Not a lot different, but a little different. We have to work around those double bonds. So let's take a look at the catabolism. First of all, uh, well, let's do unsaturated, then I'll come back and do odd carbon. Okay? So, unsaturated fatty acids get oxidized as long as the double bond is not a factor, very much like saturated. That is, we have the beta oxidation process, we keep clipping off two until that double bond starts getting in the way. When that double bond starts getting in the way, then, I've lost my pointer. When the double bond starts getting in the way, then we have to basically reorient the molecule so the double bond is oriented in the proper fashion. Okay? So that occurs. I've lost my pointer. I guess I'll be jumping up and down pointing. So if you look at the, the thing on the screen, you see oleal, oleal CoA, that's an unsaturated fatty acid, on the top. Okay? And you see that double bond, oh here it is, the double bond is positioned a few carbons in, all right? There's six carbons there, seven, eight carbons till we get to that double bond, all right? So that means the first few rounds of beta oxidation occur. The double bond's not in the way, doesn't have, it doesn't play a role. When we get to this point, the double bond is starting to get in the way, okay? Because the next oxidation, if we were to oxidize, and everything happens between carbons two and three, there's carbons two and three, but that double bond is really going to affect our ability to pull electrons off of it. Okay? So when the, when the uh, oxidation process gets to this point, the cell has to do something with that double bond. You might say, well, there's a double bond during fatty acid oxidation. Okay? We pull those hydrogens out of there. Why can't we just do that? Well, we could if the double bond were in the right place and if the double bond were in the right <coughs> orientation. The double bond that we had in beta oxidation was a trans double bond, and it was between carbons two and three. What we have here is a cis double bond between carbons one, two, three, and four. That is three and four, right? So it turns out that whenever we have that situation, the cells have an enzyme that handles it very simply. Very simply. What does it do? It converts a cis three, four, to a trans 2,3. Now it looks exactly like an intermediate in fatty acid oxidation, and the beta oxidation process proceeds. The next step in beta oxidation of this would involve addition of water, which is what happens right here, and then ketone, etc., and we go with beta oxidation. Now you might look at this and you might think, oh, I keep hearing about trans fatty acids. <clears throat> is that what these things are that I'm looking at on the screen? No. They're not, okay? So these trans fatty acids are intermediates in a metabolic process, okay? They are not fatty acids that are um, uh, something that like what you get in your diet, okay? The trans fatty acids you get in your diet comes from what's called trans fat, <clears throat> and it arises because food manufacturers partially hydrogenate vegetable oil. The partial hydrogenation of vegetable oil is done to raise the melting point. I think I mentioned that in class earlier. It's done to raise the melting point, and the process of partially hydrogenating it, some of the cis bonds get converted to trans. Those trans fatty acids in the fat are not metabolized anything like these guys are, okay? if they get metabolized at all. So trans fatty acids that result from partial hydrogenation of fatty acids are not these trans fatty acids. And more importantly, they contribute, it appears, to some significant health problems. These include increased uh, susceptibility to atherosclerosis. They include higher levels of, of LDLs in the bloodstream. These are the so-called bad cholesterol. 
They also increase inflammation, which is, which is, which is another issue. Okay? So these are problematic trans fatty acids. These guys aren't in that situation. Okay? So that enzyme name is a good one to know, enoyl-CoA isomerase. It's telling us that it's taking an enoyl group, which is this guy here, and isomerizing it. It's converting it from a 3,4 cis to a 2,3 trans. Once we've gotten past that, then beta oxidation continues, and we finally end up oxidizing all those carbons off of there. OK. Now, polyunsaturates are a little bit more complicated. And I'm going to step you through it, but I'm going to do you a favor. I'm not going to make you know it. How's that? You're supposed to say, yay. yay. <laughs> if I don't get that response, I'll just say, no, you do have to know it, right? That would be evil professor. All right. So I gave you the situation where the trans fatty acid is in a perfect place. It's in a cis-3,4. And I've got an enzyme that converts a cis-3,4 into a, into a trans-2,3, right? Well, what if this guy is positioned in a, in a cis-1, oh, oh, sorry, let's see, we'll get it down to uh, here, a cis-1,2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Here we are. Here's the, here's the problem. One, two, three, four, five, OK? So between four and five, we get it to this point, we've actually got a problem. We can't go forward with this oxidation here. We've got to deal with these two double bonds that are here. The enzymes just won't handle it, OK? Well, this is a different situation. And so what, they, what this cell is trying to do is convert these two double bonds into one double bond. And in the process of converting those two double bonds into one double bond, make an intermediate that's going to work. Okay? Now, your book has an error. Okay? And since I did this from a book, I copied the error. Okay? So I'll show you the error. The error is right here. This guy converts these two okay, into a, uh, what's actually a cis double bond. It's not a trans double bond. And that's important because this cis double bond would be 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? 1, 2, 3, 4. All right? So the enoyl coa isomerase is going to convert a cis-3,4 into a trans-2,3. This should be a cis bond. This is, I'm not going to make you memorize that. You're, you're set. Now, in order for this to work, I have to have two enzymes. The first enzyme has to convert the two double bonds into one. That takes electrons from NADPH. And then the same enzyme as before, enoyl coa isomerase, has to convert that cis into a trans. When that happens, everybody's happy, and beta oxidation continues. Okay? Now, the reason I don't make you memorize that is students get very worried about, oh, my God, all the steps that are in here, all the names that are in here, et cetera. And it's just basically a rearrangement to get something that we can already deal with that you've seen, which is enoyl coa isomerase. Okay. All right. Um, the last thing I want to say about fatty acid oxidation re relates to oxidation of fatty acids that have odd numbers of carbons. I said, I said on Wednesday that most of the fatty acids have even numbers of carbons. But not all of them. Some have an odd number. Well, odd number of carbons poses a bit of a problem. If I've got an even number of carbons, I go from 16 to 14 to 12 to 10 to 8 to 6 to 4, and I cut the 4 in half, and I've got two twos. If I have an odd number of carbons, I go from 13 to 11 to 9 to 7 to 5 to 3, <coughs> and I can't cut 3 into a 2 and a 1. The enzymes won't do it. So I've got to deal with that 3. Because if I don't deal with that 3, I'm going to have problems. The 3 is a molecule called propionyl-CoA. It okay? has three carbons, two carbons attached to a, um, a uh, carboxyl group. It okay? has three carbons. Here we go. Right? So we go down here. We we're left with propionyl-CoA. And now this, I think, is one of the oddest things that cells do. It's really weird. Okay? You'll see how weird it is in a second. We've got a three carbon molecule. What we're hoping to get is a four carbon molecule, right? Wouldn't you like to just put a carboxyl group on that three carbon molecule and make a four carbon molecule? We've seen other reactions that do this, carboxylases do this. For some reason, cells don't do this. Okay? They have a very odd way of going about this process. What do they do? 
Well, they first of all grab this three carbon molecule and they say, okay, we'll put a carboxyl on it, but we're not going to put it on the end. Okay? We're going to put it onto a, uh, a middle carbon. Now, this doesn't show the entire figure. In fact, it puts it onto a middle carbon in one configuration. Remember, this carbon has four different things on it, so it can be arranged in four different ways. So it puts it on in the D configuration. And then after it's put it on the D configuration, another enzyme converts it to the L configuration. And then after it's converted to the L configuration, it takes that carboxyl and puts it on the end where it should have gone in the first place. Okay? It's a several steps to get to this product that now the cell, where will the cell use this? Well, of course, it's going to happen in the citric acid cycle. All right? Now, this reaction, the reason I mention it is that this reaction is one of the reasons we have to have vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is a coenzyme for these rearrangement reactions in here. Vitamin B12 is the only biological molecule in your body that contains cobalt. And cobalt is very important in moving these carbons around. Okay? So vitamin B12 is very important for this rearrangement process that happens in here. And thanks to vitamin B12, we can make this guy and, be, and deal with it. Otherwise, we're going to accumulate this guy, and this guy, when it accumulates, probably is going to cause us some problems. There are some diseases associated with inabilities to handle some of these uh, things. Okay. Yes? Is it, would, um, Good question. So I left that very vague. It's responsible for all the rearrangements in here. Okay. So I won't pick one of those reactions, but just to say that the, there's a series of rearrangements that are happening in there, and those rearrangements require vitamin B12. OK. Well, as a consequence of that, we've now dealt with all the carbons in a fatty acid. We've now oxidized fatty acids. Questions before I move forward to another topic? Yeah? Is what? B, vitamin B12 contains cobalt. It's also known as cyanocobalamin. The, the cobalt part is the, is the cobalt. OK. Well, let's sing about it. The fatty acids carried by CoA, CoA, are oxidized inside the mitochondria. They get to there, as you have seen, by hitching rides on carnitine. Then it goes away when acids are oxidized. The electrons move through membranes. Yes, it's true. It's true. They jump from complex one onto CoQ. CoQ. The action can be quite intense when building proton gradients. And it's good for you when acids get oxidized. The protons pass through complex V, you see, you see. They do this to make lots of ATP, TP. The mechanism you should know goes through the stages, LTO. So there's energy when acids get oxidized. Now remember, fatty acid oxidation is occurring in the mitochondrion. It's occurring in the matrix. In the same place where all the citric acid cycle reactions are going on, this guy is splitting off acetyl-CoA's and dumping them into the citric acid cycle. So all those reactions that we saw that were making NADH causing electrons to flow in the electron transport system and causing ATP to be made for the citric acid cycle, those are all coming, again, through the oxidation of fatty acids. OK. All right. Let's turn our attention to a related pathway. I mentioned it the other day. It's called ketone body metabolism. And this pathway turns out to be pretty darn interesting, especially when we're very low in glucose. I'll tell you a couple medical things about this. All right? When we're very low on glucose, we are potentially in trouble. And the reason that we're potentially in trouble is because our brain and our eyes are totally dependent on glucose, and they can't make it. They need it from our bloodstream. That's one of the reasons our liver is dumping this into our bloodstream, is to feed our brain and our eyes. And when our liver runs out of the ability to do that, or if we have certain types of diabetes where we're putting up too much insulin and the cells are taking up too much, too much glucose, 
blood glucose levels will fall. Okay? I was asked a question earlier uh, in the term by a couple people about, I know somebody who's diabetic and they're told probably I shouldn't be drinking alcohol. Why is that? One of the reasons for that is that uh, alcohol inhibits gluconeogenesis. So if gluconeogenesis is one of the ways that we're putting glucose into our bloodstream, if you're inhibiting that and you're putting out too much insulin, you're going to have a glucose crash because the cells are going to be grabbing glucose faster than the liver is going to be putting it out. And so for this reason, people can go hypoglycemic with, with uh, certain types of diabetes, certain ways of having the, uh, diabetes. If you know somebody who's diabetic, they may have to take sugar pills around with them sometimes. Uh, so if they have that happen, they get the shakes, they, they can actually take that and, and, and deal with that. Okay? So ketone bodies are important. Ketone bodies are ways of keeping us going when blood glucose levels really fall. Okay? Now ketone bodies are a cool trick. What they are, are they're a way to use fatty acids to keep the brain and the eyes alive. Well, how do we use fatty acids to do that? Well, the product of fatty acid oxidation is acetyl-CoA, right? Now, we can't dump fatty acids out into our bloodstream very quickly. I've already told you about the problem with that. But it turns out we can dump ketone bodies into our bloodstream pretty quickly. So what do we do? We take two acetyl-CoA's that our liver might be, for example, breaking down. And instead of dumping them in the bloodstream, we put them together. And we put them together using that last enzyme of fatty acid oxidation, which was thiolase. You say, enzyme's doing two things. No, it's not. It's just doing the reverse of the last step of fatty acid oxidation. In the last step of fatty acidation, it's going upwards. In the first step of making ketone bodies, it's going downwards. So when we have a lot of acetyl-CoA floating around, which we do when our liver is trying to help us get out of this problem, then thiolase reverses the reaction and we make this guy right here. It's just basically two acetyl-CoA's put together. Yes? Why can't our uh, brain and eye cells metabolize uh, fatty acids directly? Um, our brain, well, for one thing, getting them across the blood-brain barrier uh, is one. Uh, but getting them there is, is the problem. You want to get this there quickly. You don't want to have a gap. And this, this is a nice, quick process. So that's the main issue with anything having to do with fatty acids, that quick energy. Okay? All right. Now, this guy's a four-carbon molecule, two acetyl-CoA put together. If we bring in a third one, okay, we make a six-carbon molecule. No, I'm not asking you to know these names. All right? But I hope you know that two carbons plus two carbons gives four carbons, and four carbons plus two carbons gives six carbons. We now have six carbons in this molecule. We have a molecule okay, called beta-hydroxy beta-methylglutaryl-CoA. I'm not going to make you memorize that, but I will make you memorize this one. HMG-CoA. That turns out to be a molecule that shows up in two pathways. One is what you see on the screen, which is ketone body synthesis. This molecule is also, as we will see later, an intermediate in the synthesis of cholesterol. In the synthesis of cholesterol. Okay. Well, in cholesterol, this guy goes off and does something else. In, fat, in uh, ketone body synthesis, the next thing that happens is the six carbons drop two of the carbons along with a CoA. So now we have something that only has four carbons. This guy had a CoA with six. This has four carbons and no CoA. This is a ketone body. Okay? This is what a ketone body looks like. It's got a fatty acid and it's got a ketone. Now, why is this important? A, this guy is soluble in the bloodstream. Floats in the bloodstream just fine. No problem at all with that. Okay? Turn this guy off. There's a problem with this guy, though. It's chemically not very stable. It's chemically not very stable. If I just dump this in the bloodstream, some of it is going to fall apart into acetone. This carboxyl uh, that's right here will pop off. That carbon doesn't, doesn't want to be on there. It pops off. And some of this makes it into the bloodstream. Some of it gets reduced to this, which is more stable, and travels better in the bloodstream. Now, technically, we call this a ketone body, but if you look at it, there's no ketone in it. 
That's a carboxyl. That's, that's an alcohol. There's no ketone in it. But this is a ketone body. Right? This guy, however, is of no use to the body. So when I say, when I get to this point, some of it goes here and some of it goes over here. So I make both of these once I've made some of this. Am I clear? This guy is of no use to the body and you will exhale it from your lungs. Now, here's an important health note. Acetone is a, a solvent. You smell it. It's like the fingernail polish remover. You smell it in organic laboratory. You should know what acetone smells like. And you can smell acetone on the breath of a person who's going through ketosis. Okay? That person's got some problem going on. They're starving. More importantly, they may have, well, I shouldn't say more importantly, but they may also have issues with diabetes. One of the first ways people learn they have diabetes is their friend smells acetone on their breath. Why would I have diabetes? I mean, how would this be an indicator of diabetes? Well, remember, diabetes, some types of diabetes are going to cause blood glucose levels to go very low. You start making ketone bodies, and when you start making ketone bodies, here you are. If you smell that on the breath of your friend, have them get checked out. Did you have a question, Juliana? Yes, that's true. I would not describe acetone as a fruity smell. Yeah, no. I, either, no. Else going on. I would say something else okay. is going on. Yeah. Yes? Um, on this hydrobutyrate. Hydroxybutyrate, huh? Is there supposed to be an O? Can that is supposed to be an O, yeah. There's, there's an invisible O right there. <laughs> okay? Now, so, yeah. Ketone bodies are produced when blood glucose is low. So how come when you check a diabetic, sometimes if their blood glucose is extremely high, yep. it'll find ketones? Is that a different, like, type ketone? Mm, I don't know the answer to that question. So if you have somebody whose blood glucose level is very high, my suspicion is they probably have some cells in the body that also have blood glucose levels that are very low. And that may be why you're seeing that. Um, what's happening with high blood glucose, so what, with diabe diabetes is a very complicated disease, okay? It happens for a variety of reasons as we're uh, recognizing more and more the type 2 diabetes, which is the most common that's out in, in the, the, the uh, public, is uh, really manifested in a resistance to insulin. Cells are resisting insulin. And they may resist insulin at their own peril. Because if you're not taking in glucose, and you should be taking in glucose, you could imagine you would have some problems with that. And so I would guess, I'm not, I'm not a medical person, I, I, I would guess so that... Would that be like if you're resistant to insulin, your cells aren't taking up glucose, so your cells are wrong? Your cells are not taking up glucose, that's right. Okay. And that's one of the reasons your blood glucose levels are high. Yeah. I, I, I'm not a medical person, so don't, don't quote me on that, but uh, that would be what I would, I would suspect there. Okay? Yeah. Actually, yeah, there, that, that's a different thing. So uh, since you asked the question, it's a really interesting thing. I'll, I'll, it's Friday. I guess I can, I can take a moment for a really interesting story. There is um, a very odd diet that they have found um, helps with some types of epilepsy. That's, uh, it's, they, they call it ketogenic. And the reason they call it ketogenic is that it's very low in glucose, and it's very high in fat. And for unknown reasons, this very high diet in fat um, uh, helps uh, alleviate symptoms of, di of uh, epilepsy uh, uh, significantly. And not for, it doesn't work for everybody, but for some kids especially, it makes a very big difference. And when uh, they put these kids on this diet, they virtually give them virtually no glucose, and they say, here, have some lard. Literally. I'm not kidding you. And it seems to work. Uh, so... Um, it's, it's a real recognized scientific um, um, uh, observation. It's not a crackpot uh, idea, but it's, uh, it's yeah. But it, that, I think, has something different than this. I, I don't know that. But I don't think anybody knows the, the, the real cause of that. Cool stuff. Nutrition's cool. Metabolism's cool. This room feels cool compared to outside. I was running around today, and I got all sweaty. I probably stink up here. All right. Questions about this? Other questions? Okay. So, so what happened? I guess I didn't tell you the end of the story. So, we dump these in the body. So, what good are they? All right. 
It's nice dumping them out in the bloodstream, but what, what in the heck are, good are they going to do? Well, this guy is soluble. It'll travel readily in the bloodstream. It gets to the brain, across the blood-brain barrier, gets in the brain cells, and the brain cell will then reverse the whole process. So what have you just done? You've just delivered acetyl-CoA to the brain. And what's the brain going to do with acetyl-CoA? Citric acid cycle. Bang. It's got energy. So this is a cool way to quickly get energy from fatty acids into the brain, get the brain metabolizing it, and keeping the brain alive. Kind of a cool thing. Okay. How long is it possible? You know, um, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I always get asked these medical questions. I, I don't know. I should have gone to medical school, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. How long after you drastically reduce your glucose will you start making the ketone in the body so it's detectable? Yeah, that's sort of the hours. question he's got. It's related. I would say hours. You could. I would say, yeah. Yeah, a person who's on a starvation diet, for example, could, could do that for a so period of time. Meal? Mm. You have more reserve than that. I would wager you have more reserve than that. You, you have in your body about 24 hours supply. If you're in, you know, eating a normal diet, you have about 24 hours supply of glycogen. That's what you've got. You know? And so if you skipped a meal, yeah, you might feel hungry and so forth, but I don't think you'd really go ketogenic with that. A really astonishing thing to me, when I first heard this, I couldn't believe it. Okay? And this, is, this, this gives you an idea of the magnitude of the turnover that we're doing with oxidative phosphorylation, okay? In your body, you make and break down your weight in ATP every day. You make and weight and break down your weight in ATP. I just find that absolutely astonishing, okay? You think if I could just break it down instead of making it, then maybe I would have my, there's the Ahern perfect diet, right? But yeah, well, I got these perfect diets that kill people. Okay, now we've got a few minutes to get started on this, and then we'll, I'll, I'll be merciful, okay? This is related, so I want to I dive into it. And the reason I want to dive into it is because um, we've seen a little bit about uh, what happens when we have too much glucose, for example. If we have too much glucose, our body bypasses the regulation from the PFK. There's a way around it. It makes these other molecules, and it bypasses the phosphofructokinase reaction. That forces the production of pyruvate. Normally, PFK jumps in. As long as you're not getting too much in the way of sugars, the uh, PFK stops the process. You don't force the production of pyruvate. But there's ways around PFK, and they happen primarily with excess sugar. So if you have excess sugar, what you do is you force the production of pyruvate. And when the body has too much pyruvate, it's only going to do one thing, especially if you're not exercising. It's going to break it down into acetyl-CoA. Well, that's fine and dandy, but let's imagine that we've got that situation. We've just forced a bunch of production of acetyl-CoA, okay? And we're not exercising. What's our, a what's our, AT our ADP levels? Low. We're not exercising, so ADP levels are low, right? ATP levels are higher. Our body's got energy. It's got all this acetyl-CoA, and what in the heck am I going to do with all of it? Well, that's what we're getting ready to talk about, okay? So if I force the production of pyruvate and I force the production of acetyl-CoA, I'm going to force this process to happen, okay? Well, what's going to happen? Here's the production. Too much pyruvate, too much acetyl-CoA. I make citrate, right? I make citrate, but is the citric acid cycle going when I have no AT when I have plenty of ATP? It's not. Why not? <coughs> so I've got too much NADH because the electron transport's not going right. So my citrate starts accumulating. When I when I have my citrate starts accumulating, the mitochondrion does this. It transports it out of the mitochondrion. So when citrate can't be oxidized in the citric acid cycle it gets kicked out of the mitochondria into the cytoplasm. This is where the problem starts. In the cytoplasm, citrate gets broken down into oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA. So what have we done? We have just shuttled acetyl-CoA out into the cytoplasm. 
In the cytoplasm, that's where fatty acids are made. We have just delivered the building blocks for making fatty acids into the cytoplasm. And not only that, we're full of ATP. We're going to use that ATP to make fatty acids. Want a good argument for exercise? There it is. Okay, Burn that sucker off. Make as much ADP as you can. Because if you don't, you're going to dump this out in the cytoplasm and start making fatty acids. All right. I'm going to go through this real quick so we can finish quick, and then we'll be out of here. Then I'll repeat it when we come back on Monday. Is that fair? <clears throat> real quick, here's what happens. Okay, You can watch on the video. All right. Two carbons go to three carbons. I put on a carbon. It's the very first thing that happens in fatty acid synthesis. Okay, That reaction you see right here is catalyzed by the only enzyme in fatty acid biosynthesis that is regulated. It's called acetyl-CoA carboxylase. This putting on the, carbo the extra carbon, in the very next step, the carbon gets removed. So it's only, a it's only on there transiently, but that putting that carbon on starts the process. It makes something called malonyl-CoA. I'll talk about regulation of this later. Okay. There's the blah, blah, blah. There's the blah, blah, blah. Biotin is involved because you remember biotin is involved in reactions that put carboxyl groups onto things because biotin can hold on to those carboxyls. Now we're going to make, make palmitic acid. The very interesting thing about fatty acid biosynthesis is chemically it's very similar to the reverse of fatty acid oxidation. Different enzymes, different considerations, but chemically it's very similar to the reverse. Okay? Well, how do we start with differences? Well, fatty acid biosynthesis occurs not using CoA, but instead CoA is swapped out for something called acyl carrier protein, ACP. There's one difference. The substrate has ACP, all right? That includes, we start, with, we start with two of these. One's an acetyl ACP, one's a malonyl ACP. That was that three carbon piece we just made. We put two together, what's going to happen is two carbons are going to stay, two carbons are going to stay, and one carbon's going to leave. That's what we see happening right here. The carbon dioxide's going away. There's two, there's two, and now we've got four. Four carbons, we've got a ketone. If we were oxidizing, we'd break it in half. We're going to do the reverse. We're going to reduce it. We're going to go from ketone to, carbo to uh, hydroxyl. If we were going in the other direction, we would oxidize. We're instead going to go down here, and we're going to pull out a water, H2O. In the oxidation reaction, we would, have, we would have put in a water. Taking out a water. We've got a double bond. It's a trans double bond. Now, instead of taking off hydrogens, we're going to put in hydrogens. And look what we've done. We've just made something that's got four carbons. It's got all single bonds. And now we bring it around. Instead of having a two carbon piece, we have a four carbon piece. And we bring in a new three, and we continue the process. Now, the beautiful thing here, I'm going to stop with this. This is where I'm going to finish. The beautiful thing here is you see all these ugly enzyme names. And they're all part of a giant complex that's called fatty acid synthase. And that's the only enzyme of the process you need to know except for acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So acetyl-CoA carboxylase was the very first one that put that carboxyl group on. Fatty acid synthase, which I'll describe to you more on Monday, is a remarkable enzyme. It works like a clock, like this. Okay? All right. Have a something weekend. See you Monday. <laughs>